Attention crew, this is your Captain Caliban speaking. This is a supplemental episode of Enterprising Individuals, where we bring you news and tidbits from the world of Trek, also interviews with special guests, and a few little surprises along the way. I hope that you're well and you're staying cool in these hot times. This week I thought we'd take a little detour from the subject of Star Trek to focus on one of the faces of Star Trek. Pride Month, where we honor our LGBTQ family and friends, has just ended, and July 4th weekend, where we celebrate our country and its democracy, is just about to begin. So I thought there'd be no better time to look at the life of one of Trek's most important stars, George Takei. In 2019, George's memoir, They Called Us Enemy, was released by Top Shelf Productions. They Called Us Enemy is a graphic novel that tells the story of the internment of George's family during World War II in a series of Japanese relocation camps. The story of Japanese internment is one that we have ample access to now, but in the days and even decades after World War II, it was definitely a dark secret about America's actions during the Second World War. George's graphic novel, made in cooperation with writer Justin Isinger, artist Harmony Becker, and with additional writing by Stephen Scott, tells the tale of the Takei family's journey from life in Los Angeles to an internment camp in Arkansas, but it also talks about the racism and discrimination that Japanese Americans experienced in that era, not just from their fellow Americans, but from their country itself. It's a fascinating read, and I'd like to summarize it for you today and give you some of my thoughts on George and his journey. So let's get underway. The first thing I want to say about this is to compare it to uh, another famous memoir in a similar style that is also a graphic novel, and that is the two-part graphic novel Mouse by Art Spiegelman, in which he tells the story of, uh, the frame story is that he talks to his father about his father's time in a tr concentration camp. His mother and father were Polish Jews in the Holocaust uh, during World War II. And that story is an amazing you know, award-winning story that kind of um, set the bar for, I think, historical uh, comic retellings uh, in this vein. And George's tale is similar to that in a lot of ways. It tells the story of um, an unassuming family uh, who is thrown into these horrible circumstances while giving yet still the sort of greater political and social context of what they're going through. Uh, and I should just say that this is uh, highly acclaimed. Uh, they Called Us Enemy has won the Will Eisner Award for Best Reality-Based Work, the Dwayne McDuffie Award for Diversity in Comics, the American Book Award, the Asian Pacific American Award for Young Adult Literature. It is very good, and it is, uh, is suitable for all ages, and it's very educational as well. And the volume starts with a flashback, a look at the moments just before George's family was relocated to a camp. And we meet uh, George's father, Takakuma Norman Takei, who was born in Yamanashi in Japan. He came to the United States as a teen, and he's involved in the dry cleaning business. And he's married to Fumiko Emily Nakamura, who was born in America, was born in California, but whose family uh, had very close ties to their family in Japan, and she actually went to school in Japan uh, as well. And as we see this scene of the family sort of quickly packing their bags, we cut to the modern day with George speaking uh, at a TED Talk that he did, I believe in 2014, that was entitled Why I Love a Country That Once Betrayed Me. And that is one of the frame narratives that bookends this retelling. George talks about his immigrant grandparents and how they themselves were boldly going to a strange new world seeking opportunities, but also seeking to, um, I don't know if I want to say assimilate, but you know, people that moved to this country, they, they believed in what America was offering them, you know, a new opportunity, the opportunity to uh, live, you know, in a culture that contained many cultures and to contribute, you know, to America, uh, both economically and, uh, and, and socially and politically as well. Um, and his family really believed in that so much so that, you know, George is named after George the Sixth because his father was uh, a bit of an Anglophile and his brother is named after Henry the Eighth. So there you go. And also George has a sister as well, uh, who was born near the start of the story and the events of the graphic novel, whose name is Nancy. And the story begins, as you imagine it would, with news of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which... America immediately reacted to, of course, um, declaring war on Japan, uh, declaring war in reaction to uh, Japan's declaration, essentially, of a declared war, uh, is how Roosevelt put it in his speech, uh, a speech that they show in, in the graphic novel, the family listening to kind of nervously, and you can kind of imagine why that would be. 
Um, almost immediately, the president signs a declaration, uh, Executive Order 9066, that declares that Japanese citizens, uh, natural born or not, were to be considered alien enemies, essentially. And that restricted them from many things. They weren't, their travel was, was restricted. They weren't allowed to fly. Uh, they couldn't have cameras or, or radios, things that, you know, if they were uh, a fifth column, if they were some kind of uh, presumed enemy that they would use to assist the Japanese forces. And you see that almost immediately uh, anti-Japanese sentiment grows. You know, there's a scene where um, the Takei family's uh, car is, is vandalized and it doesn't just stop on the street level. It goes all the way up to the government in charge, you know, Earl Warren, who at that time was the attorney general of California, would later become the governor and, of course, become a Supreme Court justice later on, talked about the Japanese situation. And he gave a speech that's recounted in the graphic novel about how, you know, Japanese citizens hadn't been caught, uh, you know, in any acts of spying or sabotage, but they're inscrutable. There's that word again. And the mayor of L.A. Uh, said that they were non, non-assimilable. There was a belief by some people that the Japanese were going to be completely loyal to Japan and there's nothing, nothing that we could do. Clearly, they would want to help out Japan in this effort. Meanwhile, George's book is just showing his father and his mother living normal lives. Uh, Henry and George are very young. They're not in school yet, really, but they're just normal kids. But despite all that, the government passed uh, some laws that basically set up areas of exclusion, of military exclusion, uh, which wasn't called martial law, but sounded a lot like it. And it meant that civilians could be excluded and relocated from these areas areas. And it focused specifically on people of Japanese ancestry. And it involved a seizure of their financial assets, uh, of their property. Uh, you know, there was a curfew for Japanese citizens. And uh, at this point in the, in the novel, we switch to 2017, where George Takei was asked to speak at the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Presidential Library for the opening of a new exhibit called Images of Internment. Um and this is another one of the frame narratives in there. And he talks about the the history of, of the Japanese relocations and the feelings that it brings up. And we cut back to the spring of 1942, where now Takei's family has been uh, in the process, pre-relocated, if you will. They're all sent to the Santa Ana racetrack in California and assigned to stables, basically. Uh, he talks about how they had to, his whole family had to just live in um, a horse stable that still smelled of manure. They had to, you know, take showers in the, the horse paddock with the horse, horse shower, uh, and people would get sick there, and they weren't being, they weren't being given, like, uh, the medicine and the supplies that they need. And he actually began, like, school, his schooling there, it's sort of an, an ad hoc school. And it was several months later that they were all put on a train, and they took a multi-day train journey to Arkansas, and it's a very surreal experience for George, who is probably five, six years old at this point, and he doesn't really understand what's going on. Um, everybody is given a tag, like they're just, people are literally tagged with like a number. And he just thought that that was your train ticket, right? That you have to get a ticket to go on a train. So we get his view of what's going on through his sort of childlike eyes, but the implication of it is is so much worse. And he talks about how there's people crying on the train and there's armed guards, you know, at, at both sides of the train. And his father is trying to make him feel better. And his father tells him, we're going on vacation. And so George just thought that, of, yeah, this is what happens when you go on vacation. They, you, they give you a, a tag and then some people are crying because they're excited and you're going to go on this vacation. And the juxtaposition between like what he thinks is happening and the kind of sinister you know, actual reality of, of the events. It reminded me of um, a Miyazaki film, Miyazaki anime films, where they often center around a, um, a child protagonist who has a sort of fantasy experience or enters a, a magical world that is kind of a metaphor for, um, for trauma and tragedy in the real world. Not as bad as something like Grave of the Fireflies. This is, no, this is more, this is a spirited away type situation. This isn't, uh, or, a, or a Totoro situation. But the fact that he, 
still had this childlike innocence throughout all this, I think is really, is really interesting. Uh, even to the point where they would stop the train every once in a while to let everybody out to exercise. But they didn't communicate this. The American soldiers didn't really explain this at all. So the second day, the train stops and they're like, everybody out. And some of the people are like, this is it. We're in the middle of nowhere. Like, they're going to kill us. We're, we're dead right now. And thankfully, that was not true. But people just didn't know what was going to happen to them. And so everybody just kind of stretches and everybody's exercising a little. At this point in the story, we kind of switch back to George talking with his father when George is a teenager. So this is um, several years after these events and after World War II. And we get the idea that his father, despite his experiences um, being an immigrant, having this happen to him, still believes in American democracy and believes in this idea of a, of a a uh, cooperative democracy and that everybody can be equal. Uh, as we go back to the story uh, with the train, everybody gets back on the train and George talks about his mother and how she was somebody who was very resourceful. You know, she made their clothes and she, um, she actually snuck her, <laughs> she wasn't supposed to do this, but she snuck her sewing machine in her bag. So when they got to where they were going, she was able to use it to make them clothes, to make them, uh, you know, curtains for their for their barracks room and make everything look better. But on this train trip, she had packed extra water and she packed candy for the boys and books. And so for them, that like, this is the vacation he was talking about. They're you know, having candy and they're like, you know, riding train. It's great. But he talked about how even then he could tell that his father was was worried. And he also talks about that we are disconnect, about how he has very warm memories uh, of this time. But knowing what he knows now as an adult, there's they're, they're poisoned in a way. There's a real weird disconnect between, you know, the memories that you have when you're unaware of the reality that you're in. On October 7th, they arrive at Camp Rower, which is in Arkansas. It's one of 10 sites, 10 relocation or internment camps. And Camp Rower had 33 blocks that could fit 250 people each. And these are um, barracks, basically. Uh, and I think it held uh, 8,500 uh, Japanese Americans um, at its peak. And they sucked. <laughs> George talks about how they were just bare barracks. Uh, they were later given like cots and a few supplies, but there wasn't anything really there. This is, you know, I guess it's late summer, early fall um, in Arkansas in a real dry area. So they were just hot and it just was not not a good time at first. But he talks about how everyone there was Japanese American, but they all came from different walks of life. They all had different jobs. They all had different economic circumstances. And so they were not, you know, they shared perhaps a racial heritage, but they didn't, nobody knew each other. And George's father um, kind of stood up and tried to become a leader. He knew that they would need to be organized, uh, especially so they could demand the services and the things that they needed from the representatives of the military who were uh, overseeing them. It was a very diverse community and all kinds of Japanese Americans were were included in that number. Um, there are there are a couple different classifications for Japanese immigrants. Um, there are the Issei, who are from Japan, first generation immigrants, you know, born somewhere else. There are the Nisei, who are the children of them, so they'd be the first generation born in America. And then there are Sansei, who are people who are the children of people who are the Nisei. And it was a very diverse community, and so George, George's father volunteered to represent his block. Uh, he spoke both English and Japanese, and so he could uh, talk effectively with both sides. And George, you know, for the most part, I think his parents did everything they could to make sure that he had a relatively normal childhood. Um, he and Henry, you know, played with each other and played with the other boys. Uh, not all the boys are so great, though. Uh, <laughs> he relates in the book about how two older boys who are named Ford and Chevy. And it's like, that's gold star <laughs> as far as like assimilation goes. That That's good work. Um, let Ford and Chevy out of here. Why are they in here? <laughs> but they told George that he could get all the popsicles and all the candy that he wanted if he went up to the American soldiers. And he 
asked for those things, and then he said two words, the magic words. He said, Sakana Beach, which doesn't really mean anything. We find out later that Sakana means fish, and beach is, if you're talking about a beach, it's just a beach, right? But I guess if you say it the right way, or if you're a kid saying it, it kind of sounds like son of a bitch. And so George does this because he's like, he's going to get that candy. <laughs> don't worry, Henry, I'm going to get you some popsicles. So he goes over to these soldiers and they're like, what's up? And he's like, popsicles, candy, ice cream. I want a tricycle. Sign on a beach. <laughs> so of course the soldiers get mad and start throwing rocks at him. And he goes back and his father, he explains to his father, like, what's, what's magic about these words? And his father's like, oh yeah, that's, um, I think this is what they, they want you to say some bad words. So don't play with the, don't play with Ford and Chevy anymore. Yeah. George told a story about how his father one day got permission to use a Jeep because he was the block manager. And George's father took the opportunity to turn that into a day trip uh, outside of the wire for his family. Uh, he took his wife and children on a drive through the countryside, and they got to visit a local farm. And George and Henry played with the chickens and saw the pigs and the animals. And it was a very strong, very warm memory for him. Winter would eventually come, and for George, who was a native Californian, it was his first taste of snow and the winter cold. And Christmas, of course, came as well, and Santa Claus came to visit for Christmas. All the kids were told that Santa would be there. There was a special meal with cake, and they were waiting for Santa to show up. And finally, Santa arrives. But as he's handing out the gifts, and he gets a little closer to George, George sees, this Santa's Asian. So this, this is not the real Santa, but George decided, I'm not going to tell the other kids. They seem to be enjoying themselves. <laughs> it's, just this, like, it's just this weird moment where there are so many things going on. You know, obviously it's, it's, it's sad that, that a young Japanese American thinks that Santa has to be like white or Caucasian. Uh, it's also that moment when George still believes in Santa, but there's this sort of dramatic irony of like George thinking, I'm going to. I'm going to protect these young children. He's having that first that first sort of inkling of, of having responsibility, being an older brother, you know, um, being responsible to, oh, I'm going to keep this guy's secret. I'm going to help the Santa out. <laughs> uh, it's about this time of the story that George talks about the continued prejudice against Japanese Americans during that time. Even the Japanese who were born in America, the Nisei, there was suspicion against all of them that they had this allegiance to the emperor. Uh, on the contrary, many Japanese Americans immediately signed up or attempted to enlist to fight in the war, but were refused uh, for being enemy aliens. They were 4C. There were plenty of Japanese in the American armed forces already, but they were required to sur surrender their weapons and they were not allowed to fight. In early 1943, however, more soldiers were needed for the war effort, so Roosevelt changed the policy and they would allow Japanese to join the military if they were quote-unquote loyal citizens. And so to determine if they were, they distributed these questionnaires to Japanese adults in the camps that asked about their histories, their family history, their criminal records, any foreign investments they had, and basically asked them to swear allegiance to America and forswear the Japanese emperor. And there were these these two questions that were specifically um, about allegiance. One was uh, question number 27. Are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty? And number 28, will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and defend the United States from attack from all forces and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor or any foreign government power or organization? And many people were outraged by these questions. They were loyal Americans, but they felt that they were betraying their Japanese heritage and selling themselves out. So a lot of them answered no, just on principle. Um, those people were called uh, no-nos in the slang. Two no's, no for 27, no for 28. And they lived in this country. They worked there. They tried to be good immigrants because they were not allowed to be citizens. Uh, and they were doing everything they could, and they felt betrayed by by this uh, by this questionnaire and by what the country was doing, some did answer yes and entered the armed forces. Uh, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team was an all Nisei unit made up of volunteers from the camps. And George talks about how the 442nd was instrumental uh, in the rescue of a different battalion and how they fought in the war. Uh, they took a lot of casualties. And some of the soldiers ended up in POW camps. 
And after the war, the battalion received uh, many decorations, like the Distinguished Service Cross, which was awarded to them by President Truman, who, in doing so, acknowledged that they fought, they both fought the enemy and they fought against prejudice. So it seems like even at that point in the war, things were slowly turning around, or at least they were willing to admit that there was prejudice after the war. At that time, uh, they received the, uh, the Distinguished Service Cross, uh, which is the second highest honor that you can receive. But many years later, President Clinton Clinton would upgrade those awards to the Congressional Medal of Honor, which is the highest uh, honor that you can receive. And at that time, George had been appointed to the Japan-U.S. Friendship Commission by President Clinton. So he was at that ceremony. This is in the year 2000. One of the soldiers honored that day was the famous Senator Daniel Inouye, who was a veteran of the 442nd and was wounded in World War II. And he had worked with George to found the Japanese American National Museum, Um, The senator passed away in 2012, but I remember personally when I went to Hawaii for a trip, I went to a military museum there because of World War II and because of Hawaii's strategic position in the Pacific Ocean, the military history of Hawaii is a big part of its, its recent history. And there was a plaque in an exhibit at the military museum there, and I remember learning about Senator Inouye from the exhibit when I was there, and I gotta tell you... His story is crazy. I won't go into it here because I want to get back to talking about George's experiences. But if you like gritty war stories, Inouye's story is unbelievable. I went to Hawaii when I was in high school. So, you know, my friends and I we were into war stories and army stuff. And we went to the museum. But when we saw that, like, his story is unbelievable. We talked about, we talked about his story for a long time after we got home. Back to George's story. At this time, there were many young men who were eligible for military service, who lived in the camps, who were conscientious objectors. These are people who refused to be pressed into military service. Many of them wanted to fight. They wanted to sign up in their hometown with the draft board like any other American and fight for America. But they refused to leave their families behind in the camps in the situation that they are in currently and fight for a country that had put them in prison, essentially. And some of these objectors were taken away to federal prison. On May 9th, 1944, George's family was relocated again to a new camp in Tula Lake, Northern California. And this process was, understandably, very hard for George and a lot of families because they had made connections with other families there and they'd made friends with people that they might never see again. Uh, They were also afraid of the unknown, afraid to be moved again and not knowing whether their circumstances would get worse. The Tule Lake camp was a lot different than the camp in Arkansas. It was a maximum security segregation camp and it was built specifically for disloyals and it was more heavily guarded. Um, even it had tanks to, uh, to guard the camp because that's necessary, I guess. Uh, they moved there specifically because George's parents had answered no to both of those questions. They were no-nos. This camp was the largest and the worst of the camps. It held 18,000 internees at its peak, and almost half of them were children. At this camp, things were a little different for the Takays. They had uh, two rooms, which is nice for the family, but their rooms were near the mess hall, which created a lot of noise and smells and distractions. Um, The advantage that George had being so close to the mess hall was that he got a front row seat at the movies that they would show on movie night. And this is where his love of film began. They would show films like the Charles Lawton, uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. They'd also show Japanese films, but some of them were missing the audio track. So a special performer called a benshi would perform all the on-screen voices and do sometimes do music and sound effects as well. Apparently this had been done in the days of silent film in Japan. As time went on, George's father was a block manager, again, as he was in the Arkansas camp. Not everything was copacetic, however. Many young men in the camp were frustrated with the uh, conditions and, and with just the situation that they were in, and they would form protests in the camp. Uh, against the treatment of Japanese Americans. The soldiers and administrators of the camp were already prejudiced against the people in the camp because, of course, no-nos were seen as disloyal Japanese. So the internees were subject to raids, and anybody who's thought to be a radical wasn't allowed to work, and there were disagreements between the internees as well over who was suspected of being disloyal or radical or who wasn't. And through all of this, George, you know, George is a young boy and he's seeing things that he doesn't understand. He's seeing very complicated emotional scenes play out. But he always goes back to his father and asks his father to explain what's happening. And the father, to his, his best of, the best of his ability, he tries to tell George what the situation is and, 
and you know what what he's seeing to explain what's happening. There's a scene that cuts to where George is a, a young man or a teenager. And he's talking to his father after the war, and he's kind of angry. He's asking him, like, why did you go along with this? He accuses his father of essentially consenting to relocation by not offering protest and saying how, you know, George, he would organize with his friends. He would have tried to protest. And George's father is is really equanimous in the conversation, even as young George is becoming angry and emotional. And his father basically owes that you know, it was a bad situation, but he says that he doesn't, he didn't feel like they had a choice at the time. He had George and his brother and his, his little sister to think about. He had the family to think about. And George still today feels ashamed that he, he took it. He was so harsh with his father um, and didn't understand the pressures and considerations that his father had to make. Uh, we immediately cut to another memory of George's where a demonstration was taking place in the camp. And George, little George is almost hit by a Jeep. and His father pulls him out of the way. And we then go back to teenage George, and he's asking his father what the circumstances of that protest were. And his father says that the protest was in the defense of a man who was arrested and accused of being a radical. And George's father says that the man was not a radical, but it was important for the people of the camp to exercise their right to assemble and to show that they were united against the actions of the camp. And that conversation was really important for George at that time. He realized that you know, that was a form of democracy as well, or at least something that you do in a democracy. You know, participating in a democracy means fighting against injustice, speaking out, making, you know, your your group, your people's um, opinions uh, and thoughts heard. Um, not all whites were terrible. George mentions a missionary named Herbert Nicholson, who would deliver books to camp members and also bring donations and personal items. Uh, he even once delivered somebody's cremated remains, which is morbid, but it was nice of him. And he wasn't always well liked by the other whites. Uh, he was attacked once on his way to the camp. But nevertheless, he persisted and he would bring he would bring people's pets to veterinarians outside of camp and get them treated and then bring the pets back. And he also advocated for Japanese Americans both during and after the war. As the war continues, things are still going terribly in Washington. Uh, a bill is introduced in the House which would allow for the expatriation of disloyal Japanese citizens. Essentially, if Japanese people in the U.S. don't feel loyalty to America, but do feel loyalty towards Japan and the emperor, they can essentially renounce their American citizenship and they can go back to Japan and really be exchanged for American citizens who are being held. And George points out the irony of them being given the right to become enemy aliens. Like they've had all their rights taken away, but here you can have, here's a right, you can quit. Basically, you can just leave America. All in all, only a few dozen Japanese Americans even took this offer at that time. And things got even more complicated in December of 1944 with the Supreme Court ruling that loyal Nisei citizens couldn't be held in the camps. And so the exclusion order was revoked. And at this point, this meant the camp would be closed and everybody would have to leave. And this is something of a disaster because these people, they've all been brought here by force with a minimum of their possessions. I'm sure in many cases, it, most of their homes like have been forfeit or just, there's just people living in them now. You know, They have nowhere to go at this point. And they're looking at having to go wherever that is within six months to a year when the camp closes. And just put the, it put the internees in a very difficult situation. Many of them didn't want to renounce their citizenship, but if they didn't, they couldn't stay at the camp. That was the sort of catch-22. And the camp, though it wasn't where they wanted to be, was a safe place for them. You know, outside of the walls of the camp, anti-Japanese sentiment and racism was kind of running rampant in the country. So at this point, thousands of Japanese Americans began giving up their citizenship, including George's mother. It's not entirely clear in the narrative the exact reasons that she made that choice to give up her citizenship, but throughout the story, you see that even though she was Nisei, born in America, she was raised traditionally Japanese, and she had gone to school in Japan, and her Japanese citizenship or her connection to Japan was very strong. It's right around this time that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed which the internees, with their isolation, didn't believe at first. They thought it was propaganda to confuse the imprisoned Japanese. Uh, George's mother, of course, had direct family that lived in Japan, and so without being able to communicate with them or know if they were okay, they had to just presume that they had probably been killed, either in the atomic blasts or in the Allied bombing of Japan. 
The day came that the Japanese surrendered, and that meant going forward, the government services would be cut at the camps now that the war in the Pacific was over and people would have to start moving out. It was at this point that George's mother and I believe that his father had chosen to go with her at that point. She'd have to face deportation to Japan. But many of the internees who had felt like giving their citizenship up was the right choice. Now they wanted to fight that and try to renounce their original declarations. It was known as the pronunciation crisis. And there was a lawyer from San Francisco named Wayne Collins who had challenged the original order, uh, 9066. And he argued the case of the renunciants who had formed the uh, Tule Lake Committee. To, to fight these uh, deportations. And Collins argued that the renunciations were not done freely, but they were done, you know, but they were forced essentially by unlawful detention. And that was the responsibility of the U.S. government. And so this, of course, you know, the wheels turned slowly. They did everything they could to fight this. And like a day or two before the deportations were scheduled to start, uh, they filed habeas corpus suits for the pronunciants and... That worked. Uh, the deportation stopped and mitigation hearings were scheduled and the pronunciants were defended by the San Francisco branch of the ACLU. And this isn't to say that former citizens and de detainees weren't deported. I mean, that did happen in some cases. But in this particular case of the Tule Lake Japanese, they avoided that outcome. And I think George says in the book that 90% um, of the mitigation hearings resulted in people actually being able to retain their citizenship. At this point, the former detainees were given a one-way ticket to anywhere in the U.S. so they could resettle. George's father wanted the family to return to Los Angeles, but his mother was reluctant because she was worried it wouldn't be safe for them there. So they decided that George's father would precede the family, and the family would remain there at Tule Lake until they could be sure that it was safe. And that meant that they ended up staying through the next Christmas and the winter until the March of 1946, meaning that they spent about four years total in the camps. But the return to L.A. wasn't necessarily a triumphant one because they lost their homes and their finances. The Takays had to live in a pretty bad part of L.A. And George talks about how difficult it was to adjust. Um, <laughs> there's a scene where his, his little sister at one point is basically like, this sucks. <laughs> I want to go home, Mom. Uh, feeling like the camps were their home because that's all that she ever knew or remembered. And George talks about how uh, having lived in a, originally in a one floor house and then later in the barracks in the camps, when they moved to LA, they ended up living in a, a hotel, a multi-floor building. So even like the stairs, having flights of stairs were a, a new experience for George, uh, living above the first floor. George's father was still acting as a leader of the community. And so he opened an employment agency helping other Japanese Americans find work. But he refused to take commission on a lot of the work that he did, which made it difficult to sustain the family. So the Decays decided to try to go back into the dry cleaning business. Uh, they moved to another neighborhood, a Mexican-American barrio in East L.A., and this time they got good news and also bad news. They received a letter from Japan from George's grandmother, uh, his mother's mother, uh, letting them know that she and George's grandfather had survived the bombing of Hiroshima. There was bad news as well because they received another letter saying that his mother's sister and her son had not survived the bombing. George talks about how after that life went on and he entered elementary school, but he could tell that things were not exactly normal. He talks about his fourth grade teacher uh, being very discriminating against him, and he began to become angry. Even, even as a boy, he began to think about the internment and how being in those camps was probably a lot what jail would have felt like. And as he got older, he became interested in history and the history of World War II and the internment. But looking through all of his history books, he couldn't find a lot of information about the internment of Japanese Americans not surprisingly. That's what drove him to his conversations with his father, where his father would sort of fill in all of the details of their time in the camps for him. After this, George enrolls at UCLA, and he begins to study theater, get his training as an actor. He joined the cast of an original musical called Fly Blackbird, which was inspired by the student sit-ins of the civil rights era, particularly the uh, citizens of Greensboro, North Carolina, and how that made him more interested in civil rights. Also, Hilariously, apparently after one performance, uh, he met a fellow actress backstage who congratulated him on his work in the show. Her name was Michelle Nichols. He also talks about another performance of the musical at which Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke and hearing his words and meeting Dr. King backstage and receiving encouragement from him and later marching with him for civil rights in Los Angeles and how those events, all those events affected him. 
But he really brings it back in the end to his relationship with his father and how he absorbed his father's views on democracy and the importance of everybody being involved in a participatory democracy. He tells the story of how in 1952, when George was a teenager, his father took him to downtown L.A. to visit the headquarters of Adelaide Stevenson's presidential campaign. And after that, uh, George and his father got involved in volunteering for the campaign. And one day, George's father left the office early because he wasn't feeling well. And a few hours later, former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt visited the offices and went around shaking people's hands and talking to people. And George met her and he felt really excited about it. But George realized only later that his father wasn't feeling poorly. His father had excused himself because he knew that she'd be coming, and he didn't want to shake the hand of the woman whose husband had imprisoned his family. And I can understand that. As George got older and he left UCLA, he moved into acting in Hollywood. And of course, he appeared on TV shows at the time, like Playhouse 90, The Twilight Zone, Mission Impossible. And of course, he was on Star Trek. And he talks in the book of the story of how he was sent by his agent to Desilu Studios to meet Gene Roddenberry. And Roddenberry is explaining to him the concept of Star Trek, the series, you know, the the role that he wants George to play. And he makes a point of the fact that the character of Mr. Sulu is a science officer. He's an important part of the crew. He is specifically a man of pan-Asian heritage. And Gene wants him to be heroic and sharp and likable, mainly because of the long legacy of Asian characters being portrayed as servants or mysterious foreigners. And he actually, like, apologizes to George for that legacy. He says, I want to make that right. That's why I want you to play this role. And George talks about the fact that he really wanted this role. Like, normally you're supposed to be like, yeah, well, you know, if I get it, it's fine. Great. If not, no big deal. But he wanted this role. So he told his agent, like, I I have to play this role. And he got the part. And he talks about the fact that not only was, you know, obviously it's it's a role that's steady work and he's going to return to it again and again throughout his life. But it also gave him a platform with which to address the social causes and social problems in society. And at this point, he talks about his work on uh, Allegiance, the musical that tells the story of the internment of Japanese Americans. He says that uh, one night after uh, a performance of Allegiance, uh, a woman came backstage to meet him, and it turned out to be his father's secretary at Camp Rower uh, in Arkansas when his father was the block manager. In 1998, Ronald Reagan apologized on behalf of the country to the former detainees, and they were all granted a $20,000 redress. Uh, George donated his to the founding of the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles. And George was instrumental in making this apology happen. He was one of the people that testified before the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. And George agrees that it was it was a win. You know, it took 40 years, but to have the government admit and apologize for what happened was a victory. Uh, it's a victory, unfortunately, that George's father never lived to see as he died in 1979. And George makes the point that uh, as he's telling part of this story, um, the, the frame narrative is that he's um, he's at the Hyde Park FDR library and he says, you know, he's sitting in the home of a man who gave the order to imprison him and his family. <laughs> he's talking about FDR, you know, a man who helped America survive the war, was a great president, established many programs to help the unfortunate and disenfranchised in the pre-war years, but could still do something like call for the internment of American citizens. And yet the country could still apologize and make restitution for what happened. And only in America could that happen. Only in America could this be talked about openly and we can tell the story in America. And that isn't true of other countries. And that love of democracy is something that George's father inspired in George himself. George ran for city council of the 10th district of Los Angeles in 73. He didn't win that campaign, but he did remain involved in city politics, and he ran for California State Assembly in 1980. And it's funny that George's celebrity is something that you think would help a a potential candidate, but it actually got in the way of some of his campaigns uh, because of the equal time rule that existed in politics. All candidates must receive the equal amount of time, like in media, promotion on TV. And so local affiliates would often choose to pull the Star Trek episodes that were airing at that time, because... I guess seeing George without a shirt on would throw the election in his favor? I'm not sure. Despite the dream of American democracy and the long arc of justice, it doesn't mean that new injustice isn't going to happen, and George makes explicit connections in the book to the recent detaining of immigrants and refugees and the ban on Muslims that happened during the Trump presidency. 
He also talks about the Supreme Court case of Fred Korematsu, as well as Gordon Hirabayashi and Minoru Yasui, who are all men who refused their relocation orders in the 40s and sued the government. And their cases were all elevated to the Supreme Court, but they lost those cases. And those decisions were never officially overturned by the Supreme Court until 2008, when the Supreme Court was hearing Trump versus Hawaii, which was a Supreme Court case involving the presidential proclamation 9645, the, the Muslim ban. That case was found for the Trump administration, but ironically, in the ruling of that case, the original Karamatsu decision was struck down. So the Supreme Court giveth, and the Supreme Court taketh away. That's pretty much it. That's the story of They Called Us Enemy. Uh, of course, George Takei is still around today. He's still doing his thing. He's still speaking out against uh, injustice. He's got 10 million followers on Facebook. Uh, he's doing fine, but he's put together uh, quite an amazing story of his time in the Japanese internment camps. Um, it's I certainly hope somebody is trying to make this into a movie or TV show, not because every story has to be a movie or TV show or because every comic book has to, but I think that it would translate so well to those mediums. And yeah, post the Reagan declaration and post, um, you know, uh, what uh, Clinton did, um, people know a lot more about this time than they did, you know, 20, 30 years ago, but we could still no more. And I think it's still a, a part of American history that people turn a blind eye to or just are completely unaware of. So I think it being a TV show or a movie would really get that message out there. I think the story, I think this story, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, you know, compared to something like Mouse, I think it stands up well against similar tales uh, of wrongful imprisonment and social injustice. And if they make this movie quick, we can get George in there as well, you know, like have him tell the tale like to, to use that frame story and have you know at the end you can have the young actor playing George you know morph into uh to current George like a saving private Ryan or something like that you know having him tell his story uh, I think that could be really cool but it's not a movie yet and if you want to read George's story you can because it's available now on Amazon for order I will leave a link in the show notes if you want to check this out and when you make purchases on Amazon through the links we provide or by clicking on our shop banner at enterprisingindividuals.com to get to Amazon. A small percentage of that transaction comes back to us at no extra cost to you, and it helps keep the warp core lit here at the show. And it counts for anything. It's not just Star Trek stuff. You know, whenever you buy something on Amazon by clicking through our links, the same deal applies. It's a great way to help support the show. Anytime you shop on Amazon, click through our banner or through your save bookmark and shop away. And maybe you're saying... I'm a huge Decay fan, okay? I've already got They Called Us Enemy, plus I've got George's other books. Oh my, there goes the internet, and Lions and Tigers and Bears, The Internet Strikes Back. To which I would say, aha, but have you seen George's cameo in the season one finale of Party Down? Because you should. He's really funny. Martin Starr tries to talk to him when he's going to the bathroom. And weirdly, I have a similar story about Walter Koenig. But I would also say, if you like what you hear on Enterprising Individuals and you want to support the show, why not head to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash EIST pod. It's there that you can sign up to be a crew member for the show and get access to exclusive subscriber content like Live Gach, our extended interviews, unpublished content where I go off the trek rails with some of our show guests. We've got outtakes, live shows, and more. So get involved, join the crew of the USS Enterprising Individuals, head to patreon.com forward slash EIST pod. Anybody can join our crew. Graphic novel fans or no, all are welcome at patreon.com, EIST pod. And as always, the best way to support the show is to tell a friend. That's it for this supplemental episode of Enterprising Individuals. If you're an Apple Podcast listener and you haven't yet, why not look us up on Apple Podcasts and make sure that you're subscribed to the show. Also, write us a little review if the spirit moves you and give us a rating at the very least. We'd appreciate it. If you're not an Apple Podcast user, you can still subscribe to the show on Google Play or Stitcher or wherever you get our show from. And if you leave positive comments and ratings and reviews on those platforms as well, we'd be eternally grateful. Next week on Enterprising Individuals, when Starfleet launched its first Warp 5 capable ship, the Enterprise NX-01, humanity was ready to take its place among the stars and experience the wonders of the cosmos. But the road was long and bumpy and filled with more moral quandaries and unwinnable battles than pure optimism had prepared them for. Now Captain Jonathan Archer finds himself in a position to negotiate a truce between Earth's old ally, the Vulcans, and a passionate but mercurial race, the Andorians. That is, if both sides don't kill each other first. <laughs>
Sailor Noob and Just Enough Trope podcast host Mikan Hana returns to the show next week to discuss an episode of Star Trek Enterprise that will put Archer's guileless determination to the test and give him a chance to prove that humanity is ready for the big galactic show. It's Cease Fire, next time on Enterprising Individuals. And until then, I'm your Captain Caliban signing off and saying live long and prosper. Thank you.